Turn with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 19. Again, reading verse 11. And I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on a white horse and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword in which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried in a loud voice to all birds flying in the air, Come and gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, mighty men, horses, and riders, flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against the riders on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, and performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. And with his signs he deluded those who received the mark of the beast, and worshipped his image. And the two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Chapter 20, starting in verse 10. And the devil, who deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They'll be tormented day and night, forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and on him was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the deep, dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. The dead and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today and the blessings you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. God is in all truth. In your son's name. Amen. Continuing our study as we're wrapping up the year-long study in this last quarter about things we recognize or or accept. Uh, we talked about uh, some of the things at the last. We talked about the return of Jesus a couple of weeks ago and how he's promised that he's going to return for his people. He's going to come in the sky with power and glory that the whole world will see him. Uh, until then, there's going to be a war basically in heaven. And that war is going to be over man between Christ and Satan and struggling to win man over to their way of thinking, the way that uh, they should live. Uh, until that time, Christ shall reign until all his enemies are defeated. At that time, he'll return with the trumpet call of God to gather those that belong to him and bring judgment on man. Last week, we talked about judgment. The fact that a day has been set aside to judge. All will be judged. There is no way to get around it. Uh, now is the time, according to Jesus, the last days. Now is the time for judgment. We talked about the fact that judgment uh, takes place in this world and ends with death. There's no more changing after that. All that judgment takes place. We have physical judgment that takes place on us today, along with the ultimate judgment of our decisions and our actions and our faith and whatever that ends when we die. Uh, with the rejection of Christ as king in uh, AD 30, it brought on uh, uh, the death, I mean, the, uh, the end of physical Israel and judgment upon them. Uh, we saw how judgment was mirrored in a physical sense with physical Israel and can be understood when we see that how God is going to do it with spiritual Israel, with us today. Uh, when Christ died, he started bringing on trials and judgments as described throughout all the New Testament, all of Paul's writings, all of John's writings, uh, especially the book of Revelation, how trials and judgments on the world would begin and that they would begin with his people to determine who would remain faithful or who would choose him. 
God's people is going to live in captivity or in this world, figuratively called Babylon, just like physical Israel was in captivity in physical Israel. While we're here in this world, we're to live even though we belong to Jesus in his kingdom. The spiritual Jerusalem is part of that. We're to live here and be faithful to him in spite of what goes on until his victory and his return. While in captivity, we're promised, not told, we're promised that we'll face trials and tests of our faith. And there will be judgment on those who are opposed to God. Ultimately, he's going to return to pass uh, to pass sentence on us, which is what we refer to as the day of judgment. The day, the final day. And it's really a time of sentencing, because judgment's already been determined. We've already been determined whether we're going to be faithful or not. As a matter of fact, as we just read, all that's determined, and if you're faithful, you're in the book of life. If you're not, you're not. And as we go through today, the lesson is titled The Punishment of Hell. It's one of the topics that most people don't like to talk about. As a matter of fact, very, very seldom do you hear sermons about it. You used to hear it all the time in the days of old. Try to convince people that they needed to change their ways. Sometimes we need to have a little more of that to understand that there is a choice. That's what that war is about. Today, we're going to take a look at hell and what the Bible talks about it. Uh, some people think it's an imaginary place. Some people think it's a real place. So we need to look at that. First thing we need to understand is that hell is referred to as the second death. What is death? Separation. Separation. That's the key to understand. We understand it in a physical sense because... When a person dies in this world, their, spirit, their soul or their spiritual body separates from their physical body. Okay? So we can see that. So death is nothing more than separation. Physical, when Jesus in Genesis chapter 3, God said that death was coming to the world, he was talking about both physical and spiritual. There would become separation. And physical death began at that moment that God separated himself from man. It was no longer walking with him every day. No longer was uh, providing him with the tree of life. Separation from him because of sin. Um, the text that we've read probably the last three weeks in a row or talked about is found in Matthew 25. We'll talk about it for just a minute. In Matthew 25 we find... What? Lots of, Lots of stuff. You're right. There's actually three different uh, parables written in there. But the one we've been talking about is the one where God talks about the end of time, the final judgment, the sin of sin, and he says that, um, that he gathers them, uh, everybody together and he separates them, uh, the sheep and his goats, one on the right, one on the left. And then the king is going to tell them something. And when we look at verse uh, 41, I was using a different Bible to study out of, which is not a good idea sometimes. I didn't get to remember where it is in the page. Uh, verse 41, it says, To those on his left, depart from me, you are first into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And he goes on to explain why, and the reason is very simply, they chose to serve themselves instead of others. And verse 46, he says, and they will go away to eternal punishment. So we look at this, and we look at the sentencing of those, uh, the, what he refers to as the goats, which are those who serve themselves instead of Christ. He, he gives them some pretty, they may not have saw it, but it's pretty clear on what was going to take place. Let's look at that verse 41. What's the first thing he tells them? To those on his left, he said, Depart from me. What did we say separation was? Dead. Dead. We're talking about it now. That's what he said. Depart from me. So the first thing he was telling them is, you will no longer be with me. Of course, we go on to see this is all eternal. It's forever. So we find that this, when he says that, he says, depart from me. They'll no longer be in the presence of the king. They'll no longer be in his presence. And anything of that... Uh, about him that you want will no longer exist. You 
will no longer be his presence. So that's the first thing we need to understand. That's part of it. That's what this sentence is about. Depart from me. Those who are cursed. Okay, so that's the second part of those who uh, are rejected. They go into this punishment. They are cursed. What does it mean to be cursed? Rejected. More than, yes, but more than that. Bad things happen to them. All these different things to pay the price for the way that they was behaved. When someone asked God to put a curse on them, look throughout the <coughs> Old Testament without even getting into the world and curses. But look at that. When somebody looked at that uh, and things that somebody did and called upon a curse on someone, it was for bad things to happen, was it not? This morning, Mr. Snake and I had a little falling out. And I don't like those things. That's a cursed animal. Cursed, all right. There's the first cursing. God cursed the ground that the Satan worked on. Oh, he was. I left him alone. Okay. Well, what do you All right. So we talked about cursed. It's something that is not good. It's something that happens. As a matter of fact, God said uh, after the time of Noah, what was going to be that the earth would be cursed because of what? What did this man do? Do what? Work. Well, that's a curse on man to work. The devil. But more specifically, man's evilness causes people to be killed. Bloodshed. God curses the ground because of the blood. Remember why uh, uh, God threw one of the reasons that God sent Israel into captivity and put all those curses on them? Because what did Manasseh do? The Filled Jerusalem with the shedding of innocent blood. A curse. God promised the most the greatest curse would be on those who shed innocent blood. So a curse was something that was very clearly punishment. Severe. The third thing he talks about. Uh, those who are cursed goes into the eternal fire. By ever been burned? Yeah, I suspect most people haven't been burned uh, bad enough to really understand the pain and what happens with it. There's most people know, know of people that have gone through it. They're being burned over large portions of their body. Imagine that happening forever. It's an eternal fire. And then the fourth thing he says is, uh, let's see, apart from me, cursed, eternal, Eternal punishment. Okay. Prepared for, oh, down in verse 46, he calls it eternal punishment. So it's not a one-time thing. You burn and it's over. It's a punishment. It's something that goes on and on and on. Think of it in terms of imprisonment in the old days. Not in the United States, but in the old days before that. When you were in prison, punishment was regular and every day in a very, very bad way. So we look at that. And we see that's the description that Jesus gives right here of what is promised to those who do not do what he tells them to do, who do not serve him, who to serve him. All right, to better understand it, what it is hell, first of all, it comes from a Greek word that's Gehenna, uh, I think it is, which is the same reference to a place just outside of Jerusalem. Anybody remember what about that? Valley of Hinnom or Hinnom? Yeah, Hinnom. You always get K's and H's and that stuff here. Valley of Hinnom. What was so unique about this valley? Basically, the garbage dumps. This is where they took care of the dead animals and they unplanned them. They scared out there and they had a fire burning all the time <clears throat> so that they could dispose of the unplanned Okay, so when Jesus talked about that you're going to go to Gehenna, this is the reference that they understood when they were sitting there and they were looking around. It was just right outside where he was talking as he was speaking at that particular time uh, to his disciples in Jerusalem. You know, at the end there. So he's talking about that making a reference. First thing to remember is it was not in the city. It was outside the city. What did uh, Moses say, or what did God say that Moses wrote down? What was going to take place outside of the camp? All uncleanness. 
If you are not part of his people, if you are not made up, you're not holy, if you are not pure, you are not clean, then you are cast out of the camp. So basically, once again, this depart from me, there it is, right here. They're separated, they're cast out of Jerusalem, out of spiritual Jerusalem. They're no longer a part of it, they're outside of the camp. Because it's a place for that which is impure, garbage, defiled, those kind of things. Uh, he also goes on to say it's the place where the worm does not die. This is in Mark 9, 43. Where the worm does not die and the fire never ends. The worm was always in the decay and everything there. It was just always about to rot and decay. But the fire never, ever ends. So when Jesus talks about hell, that's the way he describes it. That's what he calls it. That's what he makes reference to. What else took place in this valley in Israel's history? You remember? That's where they stole, that's where they offered the children the whole bunch of children. There you go, let's go back to Manassas. This is the place where they actually offered them. So basically what Jesus is saying is, this place where you have cursed the ground because you have shed innocent blood, you're going to go there. Because it was a pile. Yep. Okay? So he basically, Jesus is telling him, this is where you're going, to a place of defilement, a place where it's cursed because of the shedding of innocent blood. Not only that, they went, and while they were there, they, when they sacrificed those children, they were doing what? Worshipping someone else. Mother. And worshipping God. So basically saying, okay, you made your choice. You could be in the city with him and the pure, or you could be outside the city with Satan and sin and, and serving Molech or Satan or whoever you want to call it, and you made a choice. So you'll be out there at a place where you'll be serving someone else besides God. Okay, Someone that was a God that was so evil that they pretty much uh, had the characteristics of Satan. So we see this taking place. In uh, Matthew 25, as we read, he talks about eternal punishment with eternal fire. We think of punishment, we think of fire, we think of those, but the big word there is eternal. Everybody's been punished. Everybody's been burned. But none of us have gone through that for eternity. And it's really disturbing to me that that fire has no life. The fact that it's darkness, and then, you know, uh, I was in, in caves and had lights turned off, and it, it, I mean, just so black, <coughs> it's, it's oppressive, it feels like you can't breathe in there, and to imagine that would be burning with no hope or glimmer of any kind of light whatsoever, and that, that kind of terror that flies me. get an idea that it's not the place where we are. Our worst fears. Okay. Your worst fears it is, 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 is forever your worst fears. Alright. Okay. Uh, Revolution, Revelation we talked about, he calls it the lake of fire or a furnace of fire. So it's talking about fire, fire, pain, burning once again. That seems to be the primary uh, reference that's made. Everlasting destruction in 1 Thessalonians referred to that. We've already talked about outer darkness, pure blackness. We've talked about the falling, the bottomless pit. These are descriptions of what it is. And I think John hit it on the head when he said it's described because it's not really, we don't know physically exactly what it is, but what we do know is all of those combined, it's worse than you can ever imagine. And that's the closest thing that even Jesus could describe it to us to get us to get the idea. And the idea being it's, it's your worse than your worst fears forever. I think John, when he went and we shot him, he was loud and 
did the visions of heaven and he came back and he wrote down about all the precious stones reflecting all the light and the, the, the streets of gold clear as glass because basically they're polished because of everything in the heaven was reflecting light and that light was gone and, and so he wrote it down in terms I, I don't know I, I'm certainly Over 
uh, serving Christ and all the rest of the, those that are, he created. All right? The big question always comes back, and I'm sure you've heard it, how can a loving God condemn someone to hell? You ever heard that question? Oh, yeah, we we'll ask that all the time. And as they turn around and reject him, they reject what he says. But the thing about it is this. Word God is what? What? Love? Truth? The Lord, light? And, and life. When we study about John, remember how we used to throw out all John's writings? He talked about describing him as love, life, and light. Light has to do with truth, it has to do with righteousness. Love, we've talked about that. Agape is a givingness and all that. Life, that's everything there is about existence that's good. So we look at that, and he is light. He's righteous. So if God is righteous, we need to understand from Genesis chapter 3 and on, when God had to separate himself from man, then it is impossible for righteousness and unrighteousness to be in the same place. Just like it's impossible for light and darkness to be in the same place. Remember that discussion we had a year or so ago about that? You can't have them. They can't exist together. You're either in the dark or you're in the light. You're either in righteousness or unrighteousness. That's why God is separated from man, because man is unrighteous, and he cannot be in his presence. It's not possible. So these two things have to uh, uh, be separated. It's the reason for separation in this world, physical death, and it will be the reason for separation in the world to come, spiritual death. That's why sin or unrighteousness brought death in both ways. Physical separation from God and spiritual separation from God. All right? The next thing is, you have to ask yourself, why wouldn't he? People say, why would God do this if he's a loving God? Why wouldn't he? Think about this. Didn't uh, he give his son to die so that we wouldn't have to go to hell? Think about that. He did that so we would not have to be there. If he did that, all he expects us to do is to give ourselves, die, be buried, to, uh, to this world. And if we will do that, then he will give us life. Then he will give us uh, not uh, the the take us from going to hell. So if he has given his son to die for us, and all we had to do is turn around and give our life back to him, then we wouldn't have to go to hell. Why wouldn't he put to, send the person to him that says, forget it, I don't care what you've done for me? I mean, think about it in earthly terms, in human terms. If I did something for somebody and they turned around and spit in my face after that, you think I would care? I know you and I, I would do that. I don't know if that's you, but I'm sure. Huh? Yeah, I killed your son, too. So the fact of the matter is, we need to be asking the other question why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he? You wanted a better understanding of it? Has he done this before? <laughs> He's got an example. Yeah, the eight. 
And that determination has to be a good and just God. One that says right, wrong. Makes a determination. As long as man makes that determination, there's a root. Then there's, there's a problem. And the real problem, I think, that we're really asking when we're saying that is, and when we're dealing with that, is the real problem is not whether the God is just and should do this, but instead um, is the problem is we want to decide what right and wrong is, don't we? I want to decide it, not you. Let me decide what's okay and what's not okay. And the problem when we talk about good men and bad men is all in our particular frame of reference. Hitler described what he thought good men were. Most of the world didn't think that way. But it didn't matter if God is not good and not just and not real. But instead, God defined what was okay and not. And from God's determination, we can determine that he was not right. He was wrong. He was unrighteous. Based on God's definition. So there has to be that final definition that only a God can make and only a good God can make. So when we ask ourselves about a good God, we need to understand that without hell, there is no good God. Without hell, there is no good God. There has to be punishment for wrong. We, most of the time, the problem is we reject God's definition of righteousness. And we cut substitute it for our own. If we'll just do this, not what God said, but what did we say? Or if we live ourselves and we're basically... Quote, basically a good man and do live a good life, then we're okay. It doesn't matter the thing, some of the things we do or whatever. The problem is God said if you violate the law or you do something, you're held accountable to it. Unless he gives you a way out, which we'll talk about next week. But so we look at it and we see that there is accountability and a just God does think about it. As a matter of fact, I wrote down here from the National Bible, without a God of justice, we're no different than a dog. Think about that. A dog walks and does, does what it wants to do. It decides what is okay and what is not okay. Sometimes it kills, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's killed, whatever. It doesn't matter. If there is no God of justice, then we're just like that, and it really doesn't matter what happens one way or the other, and how we behave, and how we walk, and where we go, and what we do. It absolutely does not matter. So we need to understand that a loving God has to have hell, and has to have a punishment for those who have chosen to reject right. All right? Last thing I want us to take, and we only got a couple minutes, is this. We read through it in Revelation that what is going to take place is there's going to be a defeat. We've already studied about last week, the week before Christ is going to defeat all his enemies and then bring punishment upon them. We started off when it talks about how Christ judges and makes war. We talked about that's what's happening right now. He's judging the earth, and we're dealing with those judgments in our lives and everybody's lives daily. And as he makes war and on, the, on evil, on Satan, he says that the armies of heaven follow him as he, as he does this, and he strikes down the nations with the sword. Where's that? What's that sword? It comes from his mouth. His word. That's what he judges with. That's what he strikes down the nations with. He rules with an iron scepter and brings the wrath of God. It's his job to do that. He defeats uh, the beast and the false prophet. Years ago we looked at that. Basically he's talking about all the nations of the earth, uh, the, the, the nations that are opposed to God, which is all of them, that are in opposition to God. They're defeated. And those that teach false religion, false prophet, they're defeated. He says, where do they go? Thrown into the lake of fire. All right? After that, it says, uh, the devil, slash deceiver, because he says the one who deceives, he is taken in, thrown where? 
into the lake of fire. Then he goes on in chapter 20, he continues on, he says, all the dead, all the dead are judged. Or as we talked about, the final judgment, meaning sentencing. So all the dead are basically called and separated and, and sentenced. And they were sentenced according to what they had done. Most of the time when I read that, I've always thought about, okay, what's my list? You know, we've even talked about the movie screen going in front of us where Billy says, you know, with all the things we did right and wrong. Uh, this isn't all the things we've done. He's making reference to what? Whether we choose to be faithful to him or not, because if we have done the things, guess what? Our name is written in the book of life. Now, in the book of life, it doesn't go, Scott. He was a good guy to say he did this, did this, did this. It just says Scott. It's a listing of names. That's all it is. And so he started going through and he says, based on what they have done, whether they have chosen to follow him or chosen to follow Satan, which camp are you in? Which kingdom are you choosing? All right? So the determination is there based on what you have done or decision you have made. Um, death and Hades are thrown in the lake of fire. Once, one more enemy thrown in the lake of fire. And anyone whose name was not listed in that book of life, where are they thrown? Lake of fire. Okay? And he goes on to tell us in verse 14 that the lake of fire is the second death. It is the eternal separation from God. The eternal separation from love, which means you're in a world of pain, Eternal hate. Separation from life means you're in eternal death. Separation from light, you're in eternal darkness. The second death has no power over those who have a part in the first resurrection. Chapter 20, verse 6. What does that mean? Who, who took part in the first resurrection? He was a person. Christians! He died. And buried and first resurrection. We are raised from the watery grave. So we find that our first resurrection, the second resurrection is when we're physically raised and a twinkling eye become a uh, immortal or whatever. But those that are uh, face that go through that first resurrection, that second death of separation and power. All right. That, that, that idea is there is that separation. There is no hope. No hope of ever getting out of that. You know, the doctrine of purgatory, we don't know if you punish for a while, and after a thousand years, maybe you'll get out. Ain't there. Ain't there. Look, man, I can't, can't face it. I will have to find you separated from God. I have to find